All right, yeah, welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. This week we have ourselves an Eldrazi Aggro deck. So I have played this deck a single time on this channel before in one of the announcement videos. Um, but essentially what inspired this was someone on Reddit asked about uh, making a deck around Nettle Drones, which is the 3-drop, three 3-1 three Eldrazi creature, this guy here. Deals 1 damage to each opponent. When you cast a color spell, you get to untap it. So I ended up sending him a list with some updates and it just inspired me to make a an updated version of an old deck I'd not actually played on the channel. So that's what we're going to do. So Eldrazi Aggro is a red-black deck that uses a lot of hasty creatures and hasty enablers to get through a lot of damage. And when you can't get through your opponent's creatures and stuff like that, then we have things like the Nettle Drone that can just deal damage without having to attack. Things like the Dominator Drone that drains your opponent whenever you uh, have another colors creature on the board. Stuff like that. And Flare Drones. Oops. Flare Drones when colors creatures enter the battlefield. So we're really exploiting the late game in kind of drain or pinging triggers, whichever one you want to call it. It's not... Drain's usually um, the life that you take from them comes to you. Um, that's the usual term for it, but... I like to just call it Drain anyway. So anyway, let's start right at the very beginning, shall we? We've got Bomat Courier. So this is a one-drop colorless creature, 1-1 one, one with haste. Whenever Bomat Courier attacks, you get to exile the top card of your library face down. You can pay red to discard your hand, sacrifice Bomat Courier, and put all cards exiled with Bomat Courier into their owner's hands. So this is a great turn one play, just to start getting loads of cards underneath the Courier. Um... The main upside to this card is that when you are empty-handed, if you've still got Bomat Courier on the battlefield, then you can just pay one and get however many um, cards you got, which could be about two or three, uh, depending on whether or not uh, you had any sort of um, any roadblocks along the way anyway. So as many times as it attacks is as many cards that are under it. So when you're empty-handed, you just pay one and you get a refilled hand, which is not too easy in like red and black without... Uh, draining your life and stuff like that. We tend not to need to actually refill our hand that much because we kill quite fast. So just having a Bomat Courier for that occasional moment where we really are in that long game and we need to finish it out is really good. We then have Forerunner of Slaughter. So black and red, 3-2 with Devoid. So it is colorless, although it does cost two different colors. And Eldrazi clone, uh, clone, drone, uh, pay one, target colorless creature gains haste until the end of the turn. So as long as this guy's out, any creature we play, as long as we have one extra mana on the battlefield, we can give it haste. So we can really throw out a lot of creatures that your opponent might not expect to come across. So they really have to uh, overextend onto their board just to make sure that you're not getting in as much damage as you need to. So we've got three of them, because they are 3-2 for two, two, which is pretty good on its own, and it also triggers a lot of stuff. We then have Scrap Heap Scrounger. So this is one of the newest additions to the deck. Uh, Kaladesh staple for black decks anyway. Uh, two drop, 3-2. Three, Can't block. However, you can pay one and a black to exile another creature card from your graveyard, and th then you can return this guy from your graveyard to the battlefield. Which, yet again, causes triggers on Enter the Battlefield effects and stuff like that. And it's also counted as an artifact as well, which enables our unlicensed disintegrations and things like that. So it's really good for that. Really hard to get rid of because you only need an extra creature in the graveyard, which after a board wipe is probably likely to happen. So even through board wipes, then this guy can still come back and still be an absolute nuisance to your opponent. We then have Smuggler's Copter. Yeah, again, it's Kaladesh stable at this point, so I figured I might as well uh, add it in. So, 2-drop for a 3-3 flying artifact. Whenever Smuggler's Copter attacks or blocks, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card, and it has Crew 1. Every single creature in our deck has the ability to crew this Smuggler's Copter, so it's pretty good. Uh, so, this allows us to sort out our hands. This is another alternative to not needing to put card draw spells into the deck. Things like Read the Bones. We don't really need them because we have Bomat Courier. And we also have Smuggler's Copter as well to loot away those extra lands if we're getting flooded. Or just find the uh, the best answer for the situation we're in. Maybe we need our Exquisite Firecraft, for example. So we might want to start looting for that. Or our opponent has clogged up the board and we need to get flyers over the top. Either way, Smuggler's Copter is really good. Also, Colorless, um, Colorless Card, which untaps Nettle Drone, which gets us some more damage in. 
We then have Harness Lightning, so for one and a red instant speed, you get to choose target creature and get three energy. Then you may pay any amount of energy and Harness Lightning deals that much damage to that creature. So Harness Lightning is a great way to take out creatures. It's also a great way to bluff as well because you don't actually have to spend the energy until after the spell resolves and at which point there's nothing your opponent can do about it. So you could point this Harness Lightning at your opponent's creature and if you have enough energy to uh, represent lethal, then they might want to put a Blossoming Defense or something like that on it. And in which case you just pay zero and you just get the three energy. And what do we use our energy for? Well, we use it to fix our mana mostly. We have ourselves some Ether Hubs, so they are, they are pay one energy to add one mana to your mana pool. Other than that, we don't really use energy to be honest, so... Harness Lightning pretty much keeps our lands open. It should also be noted, we have a lot of colourless cards, so even if we don't have energy for the Ether Hub, we can still use this, uh, this card very usefully. It isn't a problem for us to have uh, no coloured mana, really. As long as we have, like, two different sources, we can cast everything. So, yeah. Dominator Drone. We have a 2 and a black 3-2 Devoid. Yet again, it is a black card, however, it has no colour, so it triggers any colourless um, triggers, like our Nettle Drone, like our Vile Aggregates, things like that. It also has Ingest, so whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that player exiles the top card of his or her library. So, if you're really lucky, you'll hit things like Ulamogs and their game-winning cards. If they've built a deck that's kind of a play around deck, so maybe they are our old Brain in the Jar deck, for example, and you can maybe ingest their Brain in the Jars to really hurt their deck, that kind of thing. It's mostly not really that useful for us. Um, in the old deck, we actually used to use ingest quite a lot to um, process and get a bit of value out of it. But for the most part, we're actually using it just for this uh, this damage trigger here. So whenever Dominator Drone enters the battlefield, if you control another colorless creature, then each opponent loses two life. It should be noted that you don't have time to crew up the Smuggler's Copter, if it's the only creature anyway. So if you were to play a Dominator Drone and try to crew up the Smuggler's Copter to allow that, that trigger to happen, it just won't. Not in this game anyway. I'm not sure if that's uh, one of the features in this game that's not correctly implemented. I don't think it is, but yeah, so whenever it enters the battlefield, this trigger enters the stack, and my assumption would be that you could smuggle this copter, but you actually can't. So you need to have another colorless creature on the battlefield. Luckily for us, every single creature in this deck is colorless, so it's not a problem. We then have Vile Aggregate, so for two and a red, a X5 creature with Devoid. Yeah, again, it's colorless, but it is red. Vile Aggregate's power is equal to the number of colorless creatures you control, and it also has Trample. So this is our way of breaking through uh, big lines of defense. So if they're playing things like Thopters and they're just chump blocking our creatures, Vile Aggregate's the way to uh, push that through. Also has Ingest, and if you're like me, you hate having your deck ingested, so you'll do anything to stop it from happening. So this can actually cause your opponent to want to block equal to its power, rather than just equal to actually killing it, just to stop this ingest trigger from going off. Because I hate being ingested, it's very annoying. But it doesn't very, very happen very much anymore, so, you know, I couldn't be happy about that. So yeah, he uh, can get pretty big, he can be a 5-5 most of the time, but for the, most point, uh, for the most part, if you've got a fair few of these down and you're playing your Nettle Drones, you're going to get these guys to be really big and swing through with the Trample. We then have Nettle Drone, the inspiration for the deck. So a 2 and a red creature with Devoid. It is a 3-1, so it, its downside is that it can be twin bolted and burnt away really easily. We have a few ways to get around that, however, um, it's not its not one of those things you need to worry about too much. You just have a bad matchup from here and now. Um, but Nettle Drone has tap, deals 1 damage to each opponent, and whenever you cast a colorless spell, you get to untap it. So this is Thermo Alchemist in Eldrazi form, essentially. Um, the reason why we don't have Thermo Alchemist in here is because we have barely any instant or sorceries. Uh, we actually only have three different kinds, so that's the reason we've got Nettle Drone over anything else. But we can also untap it that way as well. We essentially have, um, if you were to think of Thermo Alchemist and all the triggers that you need to make it really good, we've got the equivalent in colorless spells for the Nettle Drone. As I mentioned, he is one toughness, so he can be burnt away quite easily, but we do have things like 
our Ruins of Oran Reef that allow us to put a counter on that creature, which means that it's a little bit harder to take this creature down. So if our opponent does have a Twin Bolt, we can just put a counter on it, and that should get it out of the range. But very rarely have I actually seen that happen. I haven't actually come across a, uh, a burn matchup in a long time uh, since I've been playing this deck this week, and yeah. So it's not too bad. It seems like a major downside, and it is, but it's not as commonly occurring as you might think it would be. We then have Flare Drum. It's essentially the same thing. For one, a black and a red, Devoid. This one, however, has First Strike, which means we can easily get in. Um, our opponent's creatures are not very good at blocking this one. And whenever another colorless creature enters the battlefield under your control, target opponent loses one life. So this is an enter the battlefield trigger for colorless creatures. This one's a cast trigger for colorless spells. So we can actually get both of these to trigger in certain occasions. So like Vile Aggregate coming down would trigger both of them. However, uh, Smuggler's Copter would only trigger Nettle Drone because it wouldn't enter as a creature. But Scrap Heap Scrounger would trigger both of them as well. It doesn't actually have to be an Eldrazi to trigger both of them, which is awesome. So with these guys on the board, we can get a lot of damage in without ever having to attack into our opponent, which is in the late game one of the things that aggro struggles with. Once your opponent's stabilized and got a decent board state down, then we actually uh, switch gears and then we end up going through this uh, pinging burn plan, which actually works out really well because in the first few turns, we've done about 9 or 10 damage to them in the first uh, couple of turns before they've got a decent board state down. So it's pretty awesome. We then have Unlicensed Disintegration, so for one, a black and a red instant speed, destroy target creature, then if you control an artifact, Unlicensed Disintegration deals 3 damage to that creature's controller. So we don't have a great deal of artifacts, but what we do have in terms of our artifacts are hard to deal with ones like our vehicles that just sit on the sidelines and are hard to uh, get rid of. Also we have Scrap Heap Scrounger that we can get back at any time with our one and a black, as long as we have another creature in the graveyard in order to trigger it. So Unlicensed Disintegration does have that 3 extra damage that it says there uh, more often than not. I've just realised my battery's gone dead. So yes, um, what we want to do this for is if our Harness Lightning, for example, has not got enough uh, energy to deal with a creature, then we use our Unlicensed Disintegrations instead. So we can get rid of our opponent's biggest creatures. Um, we don't have a way of getting rid of Ulamogs or anything like that. Unfortunately, because it is indestructible, but things like Gear Hulks and stuff like that, Unlicensed Disintegration is absolutely perfect for. We then have ex oh, we then have Exquisite Firecraft. This is the game ender of game enders in any kind of burn or aggro strategy. So for one and two red, Sorcery Speed, Exquisite Firecraft deals four damage to target creature or player. And then it also has Spell Mastery that says that if you have two or more instants and sorceries in your graveyard, then this spell cannot be countered. So right at the end of the game, the chances of you having spell mastery online are highly likely. So this is essentially a three mana, four damage burn spell that can't be countered. So in control matchups where they've allowed you to get, um, get their health down really low before they've stabilized, you can really punish them for it because counter spells will not be able to stop this firecraft. We can also use it on the creatures if we are in a bit of a tricky situation, like Kalatas being on the battlefield, for example. We want to get rid of that uh, ASAP, because our creatures are quite easy to deal with um, if you've got a lot of removal for them. So we'd want to kill a Kalatas, for example, with the Firecraft. But for the most part, we want this to be the last spell that we cast on the turn, because your opponent can do nothing about it except for gain life. We then have Chandra Torch of Defiance, so for two and a double red, we have a four loyalty planeswalker, Chandra. So her top ability, you get to exile the top card of your library, and you get to cast that card. If you don't, Chandra Torch of Defiance deals two damage to each opponent. So the really cool combo with Chandra is her plus one. If you can cast it, then you get triggers for your Nettle Drone and your Flare Drone. If you can't, it does exactly the same amount of damage anyway, uh, depending on the amount of uh, drones that you've got anyway, to your opponent, despite that fact. So, if you hit a land, it deals 2 damage to them. If you hit a colorless creature, you get to untap all your drones and deal extra damage, which is absolutely awesome, and you get an extra card out of it. We also have the aggressive option for the other plus one. We get to essentially negate the two red, uh, red mana we've spent to cast her. 
So if we plus one her with the red mana, we've essentially casted a five loyalty planeswalker for two mana that we can't use on the turn. It's the way I like to see it. Her minus three ability it allows us to destroy any creature we want, really. This is her way of protecting herself. So Chandra Torture Defiance deals four damage to target creature. Yet again, it's our exquisite firecraft for a Kalitasos, anything like that. We need to get rid of life gain creatures. That's another uh, downside to the deck is life gain, but that's aggro for you in a nutshell. So there's not much we can do about that, except for try control how much life gain they're actually gaining. And then her ultimate, minus seven, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell. This emblem deals five damage to target creature or player. So at the very max, really, it's likely to be four spells is enough to kill your opponent. That's 20 damage over just four spells, and we're casting these for three mana. So if we've ultimated her, we've likely just got a lot of cards that deal damage and will also deal extra damage for us casting them. We then have Reality Smasher. So for four and a colorless... It's a 5-5 Trample with Haste, so this guy comes out swinging right out of the gate. Uh, whenever Reality Smasher becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, that spell gets countered unless, your con uh, unless its controller discards a card. So, this guy is a guaranteed 2 for 1 if your opponent wants to remove him, which is really horrible for control decks. For example, if they want to murder it, they have to use murder, and they also have to empty another card out of their hand. And with control decks, card advantage is key, so... This is a great way to push through that extra little bit of damage. They could, of course, just counter it on the way down, but, you know, if they don't, of course, then this is what we end up doing. And at the very least, we end up having a 5-5 Trampler with haste that we can maybe Ruins of Orin Reef to make it a 6-6 that makes it even harder to deal with. So it's pretty awesome. So we've got two copies of that just for the, uh, the shock factor that it brings. The Colorless Mana isn't even remotely difficult to do because we have Ruins of Orin Reef that creates Colorless Mana. We have a single guy reach sanitarium that produces colorless mana and our three ether hubs, yet again, also produce colorless mana. So it's really easy on turn five to be able to cast this guy with no problems whatsoever, which is awesome. Next we have Sky Sovereign, console flagship. So for five mana, we have a legendary artifact vehicle, Mythic, which means that legendary means nothing in this game <laughs> for uh, this card. So it's a flying 6-5 vehicle. And whenever it enters a battlefield or attacks, it deals 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. So, this is great planeswalker removal for that kind of thing. If this guy comes down, you can probably just kill off a planeswalker with that and um, any kind of shenanigans. Um, we also, it is crew 3, which is quite difficult in most decks. However, if you've noticed, all of our creatures, uh, except for the Bomat Courier and potentially the Vile Aggregate, all have three power so essentially every single creature in our deck can actually crew the sky sovereign with no issues whatsoever so this guy can get in for a fair amount of damage and if we get our vehicles down on the turn maybe we've got an extra mana so on turn six for example we sky sovereign crew it up we can actually put a counter on it as well which makes it a seven six in this case which uh, is not easy to deal with not at all so this is just another way of evading board wipes, essentially. We only need one creature, and then our big creatures can stay perfectly safe, staying as artifacts just on the sidelines until we're ready to use them. Next, we have Chandra Flamecaller. So for four and two red, she's a four-loyalty planeswalker. We've seen her many times before, and that's because, essentially, most red decks, she's an auto-include, as long as you're not going, like, super aggro then she's a bit expensive for that kind of thing. But she's a late game winner for us, and she's also a board wipe. So for loyalty, we get to plus one her and put two, three, one red elemental creature tokens with haste onto the battlefield. So these don't trigger anything, but they are essentially nettle drones that we get to put out every single turn. And we have to exile them at the beginning of the next step, end step. So a plus one is potentially up to six damage, which could just clear the board. Right then and there, if our opponent's board wiped on turn 5, we play land turn 6, get in for 6 damage. We're probably easily around that amount of life total, so we can really get the pressure on with Chandra. We also have a 0 cost. Uh, discard all the cards in your hand, and then draw that many cards plus 1. So this is her card advantage. If we are flooded on mana and we've got a handful of lands, we get to 0 caster. And we get to put all of those cards into the graveyard. 
and then get redraws and we get an extra one as well so we can really refill our hand this way so if we can't get those three ones through just because he's got big creatures and we might want a zero or even wipe the board with a minus x speaking of a minus x chandra flamecaller deals x damage to up to uh, to each creature sorry so the turn she comes out we can minus four and kill her which is a four damage board wipe to everything we only really want to be using this when our board's being cleared and we're uh, struggling a little bit because a lot of our creatures are low toughness. So we're likely to take out our own creatures in the process if we are doing this. But if we've been plussing Chandra for quite some time and we've got her up to an 8 or something like that, we can minus her up to 8 and just completely wipe the board. She's not out of the question. Uh, for the most part though, if she's the only thing on the board and your opponent's got quite the board state, then you want to minus 3 her and try to kill as much on the board as you can. If you can get everything off the board. Well, that's essentially the deck. We have Distended Mindbender though. So this is an 8 mana. Though we will never cast it for 8 mana. Not likely anyway. Because it also has Emerge. So Emerge is 5 and 2 black. You may cast this spell by sacrificing a creature and paying the Emerge cost. And then you reduce this cost by the mana cost of the creature you sacrifice. So I'll explain that a little bit more because I think I... Uh, overcomplicated it for uh, those who are not too familiar with it. So essentially what this is, is instead of paying this cost to cast the creature, we pay this one instead. However, this one almost requires us to, sac well, this one does require us to sacrifice a creature instead. So if we want to pay the seven mana to cast our Mindbender, which is cheaper than the normal one, then we can sacrifice any creature we want. Most likely we have a three, um, three mana cost creature so we sacrifice this and mindbender only costs us four so we have our turn two players our turn three players and our turn four players are actually mindbenders and then turn five into reality smasher that's our perfect curve right then and there so what does it mindbender do well it's a five five on turn four which is pretty awesome and whenever you cast it you get to look at your opponent's hand which is information in itself it's pretty awesome and you get to choose from it a non-land card with converted mana cost 3 or less and a, converted, a card with converted mana cost 4 or greater. So we get to take up to two cards out of our opponent's hand. So this could be a board wipe, this could be a removal spell, that kind of thing. And we force our opponent to discard those cards. So anything that can really get in the way of our, um, our plans, Distended Mindbender has covered right then and there. It also just empties our opponent's hand really fast it's pretty brutal when you get mind bended because you don't want two cards for the price of one off a mind bender and it is kind of a two for one we do have to sacrifice a creature to get that price out but for things like the dominator drone we've already got our value out of it so it's not too bad well that is the deck we're going to go on to the mana base we've got six swamps and five mountains you may notice that there's a curve heavily in red and there is a reason why this is um curved in this way it's because we actually have a lot more red sources in our jewels and our special lands so we have smoldering marsh smoldering marsh enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands it's also a swamp and a mountain which is very important for dragon skull summit we then have ruins of Oran reef ruins of Oran reef enters the battlefield tapped it adds colorless to mana to our pool which does not hurt us that much uh, we have a lot of straight up colorless creatures and we have um Reality Smashers that need that colourless mana source as well, so it's quite important to the deck. It also allows us to put a 1-1 counter on target colourless creature that entered the battlefield this turn. So if we are ahead of, ahead of the curve when it comes to casting one of our creatures, we can actually pay one extra mana to give it one extra power and toughness, which is pretty awesome. So in the case of trying to get out of Twin Bolt range with our Flare Drones, the turn they come down, they can actually be 4-2s, uh, which helps with Twin Bolts and other burn spells like that. We then have Dragon Skull Summit. Dragon Skull Summit enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp or a mountain. Adds red or black to your mana pool. So uh, we need either a swamp or a mountain on the battlefield before we play this in order to get it into play untapped. Or we need a Smoldering Marsh, which is also a swamp and a mountain. So it actually triggers that ability to allow it to come into play untapped. So if we have two of these, we go Smoldering Marsh first, which comes into play tapped. Then we untap Dragon Skull Summit. We have two untapped dual sources, which is awesome. We then have Gaia Reach Sanitarium. So, legendary land. Adds one colorless to your mana pool. 
and the second ability allows us to start looting. So for two, we get to tap. Each player draws a card, then discards a card. You've got to be very careful with this, though, because if your opponent's using things like Fiery Temper, they can get a fair bit of value out of this. So you want to be using this ideally when your opponent's tapped out and when you need to actually loot a card out of your hand. So if you've just drawn a land, for example, you want to loot this away. You can also loot away the Scrap Heap Scroungers and just cast them back from your, your graveyard as well. So you can get a fair bit of card advantage that way. This is pretty awesome. It's only one of because it is a legendary land and we are running a fair few colorless, um, colorless lands. So I didn't want to uh, skew too hard into colorless because we do have a lot of double uh, red and blacks and double reds, that kind of thing. We then have Ether Hubs. So Ether Hubs enter the battlefield, you gain one energy. We use that energy either to pay and add one mana of any color to our mana pool. So you can count these as dual lands. These are red, black and colorless lands essentially for us. Um, and it does also add colourless to our mana pool without the use of the energy. The energy is really useful to us for things like the Harness Lightning. If we don't need the coloured mana from the Ether Hub, we can actually use it to add an extra energy onto the Harness Lightning. And this will deal 4 damage to our opponent then. Uh, we might have actually stockpiled on the Harness Lightning, so we probably actually have more energy than we know what to do with. Which is pretty awesome. Finally, we have Looming Spires, so this is the reason why we have more Swamps than Mountains, because we actually have Looming Spires, which are a red source that enter the battlefield tapped, which is bad for an aggro deck. However, we uh, start our aggro at turn 3, which you could probably call it mid-range, but I call it aggro, mostly because your opponent's kind of on the back foot the moment we start going. So, uh, Looming Spires, when it enters the battlefield tapped, then you get to give target creature plus 1 plus 1 and give it first strike until the end of the turn. So one of the downsides of our creatures is we have loads of low toughness stuff. So a Servo or a Thopter can block this Nettle Drone without any problems whatsoever. However, with the Looming Spires, we can make this a 4-2 first strike, which then means we get to getting a proper attack and force our opponent to trade. Vile Aggregates are also really awesome with the, uh, the first strike as well, because you get to trample over and yeah, it's pretty sweet. So that's why we actually have three extra mountains compared to our swamps, if you think about it that way. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for today's deck tech, so be sure to check out the matches that should be following very shortly after this, if not already. Uh, be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the content, it helps me out a great deal, lets me know you're enjoying the series. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more Magic Jewels, Magic Jewels content, as well as other stuff, and if you're not sure what that is, then stay for the end card, see the rest of the content I've got to offer, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.